All right, guys, so we're going to look at the causes of World War I today. So we're only going to go through half of this PowerPoint. Um, we will finish the rest um, tomorrow. Um, but you guys are only going to fill out half of the um, notes that you have um, for today. All right, so let's talk about a couple of things that are leading up to World War I. So we just talked about the Industrial Revolution. We finished talking about the Enlightenment back in Unit 6. Um, so we've noticed a couple of things changing around Europe. Um, one of these things is the growing sense of nationalism that people are feeling. And so when we talked about nationalism in Unit 6, we said that nationalism is something that can be um, a unifying force and something that can be a divisive force as well. In this case, after the Congress of Vienna, a lot of different ethnic groups are wanting to create their own separate independent countries from a lot of these large empires that still exist in Europe. So we have 1848 revolutions like France, um, Italy, um, Austria-Hungary. We know that Germany also unifies. And so examples like these where we see um, different countries coming together and uniting um, is going to inspire other groups of people, other ethnic groups to do the same thing. But this is what's causing tension in Europe. So within some of these old empires, like we see Austria-Hungary is going to be one of these old empires. Um, that unites. There's several different ethnic groups that are also kind of bunched together within those empires who are going to be trying to, um, again, break away, divide themselves from the imperial power and establish their own separate independent states. So this is what Europe looks like in 1900. So some of these large empires, again, some of them have just formed, um, but two that we're going to focus on are here, Austria, Hungary, and then we're also going to look at the Balkan Peninsula here. Um, so you'll see there's a couple different areas. Um, the Ottoman Empire is a really old empire that we've discussed in the past that has been around for a while. Um, and we're also going to look at Greece as well. So let's talk about some other contributing factors before we talk about nationalism. Um, so we have the growth of militarism. We said with the Industrial Revolution, right, technology is improving and um, so is military technology, but along with that comes the growth of milita militarism, so the desire to um, maintain and build a strong military, um, and hopefully they don't have to use it, although many countries are easy, eager to do so, right? We see war as a negative thing at this point in time, but remember, Europe has been stable for over 40 years since the fall of Napoleon. So um, a lot of people at the time may not have ever have ever experienced war. But now that we have this advanced technology with the rising or the growth of militarism, we're going to see that warfare altogether has changed. And these people aren't or haven't been exposed to it and haven't been exposed to warfare on this scale yet. Um, but the growth of militarism and the uh, desire to build a strong military is going to be one of the things that creates tension between these countries. So imagine, right, if you are, let's say, for example, France and Germany. Okay, so here's the French, here are the Germans, they share a border, right? If you're France and you see Germany building up their empire and you see them building up their military, um, that's going to seem threatening to you. So what are you going to do in return? You're going to continue to build up your military. What is Germany going to continue to do in return? Build up their military. Because, again, you share a border. And so when you see your neighbor or a country that you share a border with building up their military, it seems like a threat. Um, we're also going to talk about nationalism. Nationalism and also just general pride in your country. So not only the need to establish their own independence or some groups trying to establish their own independence, but um, people who specifically have pride in maybe some of these newly formed areas, um, want to prove that their nation is superior to others. Um, imperialism, we looked at the scramble for Africa and European imperialism in Asia as well, so in China and India. Um, imperialism starts to increase the tension between some of these European countries because they are competing for resources, right? So we looked at the Boer Wars, um, between the British and the Dutch, right? Um, and so that is one of the examples of this growing imperialism, but also growing tension between these imperialist countries. So because of all this rising tension, and especially because of the growth of militarism, European countries start to make alliances. This is not another one of our main causes. Um, and two major um, alliances emerge from 
um, are in Europe. So we have the Triple Alliance, we have Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. So this is going to be one particular alliance. And then we have the Triple Entente, and that's gonna be Russia, France, and Britain for now, right? And then you'll see here in the middle, wedged in between those, Russia is also aligned with Serbia. And then you have Bulgaria, who's oops, also aligned with the Ottoman Empire in Austria-Hungary. So like a smaller player in the game. Um, and they're highlighted in a different color because they're in the Balkan Peninsula, which is called the powder keg of Europe. So I kind of highlighted them for in a different color for a different reason. But these alliances basically ensure that whoever you are allied with, so in this case, like let's use Austria-Hungary and Germany, if Austria-Hungary, um, if let's say Russia declares war on Austria-Hungary, um, that means that Germany is then they're bound to or bound to declare war on Russia as well. They need to support Austria-Hungary. So these alliances basically ensure that you will have some sort of support in war um, should it occur. Okay. So I said that these two countries back here, Bulgaria and Serbia, are in the Balkan powder keg. So in Europe, in Eastern Europe, we have Greece in this little pen, um, the Balkan Peninsula right here. We call this the powder keg of Europe. Think about a powder keg, right? Um, when a spark would, if a spark should set it off, it would explode. And we call it the Balkan powder keg because there is so much tension in this particular region. And the, what's causing the tension is the presence of these um, ethnic groups that are um, present there. And a lot of them are under the power of a larger imperial, or, or they are being controlled by a larger imperial power. <clears throat> so, some ethnic groups are really nationalistic. So we're gonna see in Serbia and the Slavic population specifically is very nationalistic. Um, and slowly we have some of these major empires like the Ottoman Empire slowly losing control over some of their territory. They've already lost some territory here. Greece has just established itself as a country. So there has been some tension already before World War I building up in this Balkan Peninsula. Okay. And I should say, if we go back here, these are all long term. So these things have been happening, happening over a long time. So like people growing their militaries, um, making these alliances, nationalism since, you know, the early 1800s has been growing imperialism. And so when we get to the powder keg, this is going to be the short term cause of World War One. So the one thing that kind of sets all of this into motion. Okay, but let's look here at Serbia. So we said that a lot of these different areas have or are very ethnically different. So Serbia itself is ethnically Slavic. Um, it gained its own independence in the early 1900s. Um, in Austria-Hungary, it used to be part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, so the Slavs, again, located in the Balkan Peninsula, um, they uh, have several other Slavic populations that are still part of Austria-Hungary and other major empires in Europe at this time. So um, their, Serbia's goal is to unify um, as many Slavic people as possible. Because Austria-Hungary lost influence over Serbia, Austria-Hungary is strongly opposed um, of Serb or to Serbia's efforts to create a Slavic state. So they don't want Serbia to continue to expand, right? Because that would continue to cut into Austro-Hungarian territory. Um, one of the reasons for this um, animosity between the two groups as well is that Austria had annexed or basically taken over two areas with Slavic population. Okay, so right here on the border, we have Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, and so uh, they have Slavic populations there. And so Serbia is really focused to take back these areas from Austria, Hungary. Um, and they vow, and Austria, Hungary basically is vowing to prevent that from happening. Okay, so we have two opposing forces here and notice that they again share a border. So there's a lot of tension between these two areas. Um, and in Serbia, we also have a nationalist group called the Black Hand. They're really important to the cause of World War I. Um, the Black Hand was a Serbian nationalist group. They were committed basically to ridding Bosnia of Austrian rule. And so when we get to Austria, um, or sorry, Bosnia in 1914, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand um, and his wife are visiting Bosnia, okay? So they come from Austria, they're visiting Bosnia, they're in a little parade 
Um, and there are several attempts to actually uh, assassinate or kill um, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife along this uh, parade route that they are on. Um, the first attempts are unsuccessful, but when the, uh, the procession is over, they decide that they are going to, the, gonna, gonna, they're going to go to the hospital. Um, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife are going to go to the hospital. They're going to visit people who were injured during the procession because the Black Hand had made a couple of attempts to assassinate the Archduke. And so they want to go visit the people who were harmed during those attempts. On their way there, right, so the Black Hand had initially thought that they had failed. On their way there, they happened to um, stop on a corner or come around a corner where one of the members of the Black Hand happened to be Gavrilo Princip. So you can see him right here. He's being seized um, by the police here. Um, and he sees this again as an opportunity since the first couple assassination attempts have failed. Um, he successfully assassinates the Archduke and his wife. Um, so it's kind of an ironic um, series of events that the first couple of assassination attempts had failed um, and Gavrilo Princip just by chance had actually come across the opportunity to assassinate the Archduke and his wife. Um, but because the Archduke right, is heir to the throne of Austria, of course, the person who's going to be upset about this the most is Austria. And Austria knows that the Black Hand is a nationalist group that is committed to unifying Slavic people. So they're basically blaming this on Serbia, saying this is this is your fault. Okay. So Austria Hungary then declares war on Serbia and it sets in to motion the system of alliances that had been set up in Europe. So Austria Hungary declares war on Serbia. Russia then because they are Serbia's ally, Russia declares war on Austria Hungary. Austria Hungary being Germany's ally, Germany declares war on Russia, right? France then declares war on Germany and so on and so forth. And it's because of these alliances. Remember, the agreement with the alliances is that if your country goes to war, I am coming to support you. So now a majority of these major countries, these major players in Europe, are at war due to the system of alliances. And that's just not, you know, France declaring war on Germany, that's not where it stops, right? There's several other countries within these alliances, right? So Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia, right? Russia declares war on Austria-Hungary, so on and so forth. Um, and again, it sets into motion these series of alliances. So this is what World War I looks like when we get to the beginning of World War I, or this is what the alliances look like when we get to the beginning of World War I. Um, the green being the allied powers. So we have France, Italy, Great Britain, Russia, and then we have the central powers. We have the Ottoman Empire, Germany, and Austria, Hungary. And so the yellow areas are neutral. You'll see there's a couple of other green areas. These are a more minor players um, in the game or in World War One, And so this is what we are dealing with when we get to the beginnings of World War One. Now remember, a lot of these countries are gonna unify quickly and they're going to mobilize their militaries quickly because they've been itching for an opportunity to use them. They've been building up their military and a lot of countries thought that this was going to be a very short war. Um, however, like I said earlier, we haven't seen a war on this scale before and we haven't seen war or warfare like this before. So the new technology in warfare, things such as tanks, uh, we're going to see biological warfare, so the use of mustard gas as well, the machine gun. Um, these are all new and improved forms of technology that are going to change the way that people are fighting war. And it's also going to increase the number of casualties, which one of the reasons why World War I takes so long is because both sides have access to this advanced warfare technology. And so um, this is what extends it for so long. We often face stalemates in World War I because neither side can make, um, can make any progress because, again, you both possess the same amount of technology, right? And they're both, you know, equally as, um, as vulnerable to one another. So, again, we have a couple of fronts here in the war we have the Western Front, you do need to know this. This is in Northern France. So this is basically the German French 
border. That's the Western Front. And then you have the Eastern Front, and that's um, the German-Russian border. Okay, so unfortunately for Germany, which is one of the main players in World War I, they have an issue because they are sandwiched right in between France and Russia. So we're going to talk about their plan of attack tomorrow. Um, but this is an issue for Germany. But you can see very clearly here, again, how the alliances have been carved out. And our last war front is in the Balkans. So you can see here it's between Southeast Europe, Southeastern Europe, and Asia Minor down here. Okay, um, so those are the war fronts that we're going to be talking about. Mainly, we're going to be talking a lot about the Western Front and the Eastern Front. Um, this is where our primary focus is going to be. All right, so you guys are going to do an activity on the causes of World War One.